the U business. Actually, theoretical physicists were about to become more powerful than Oppenheimer had ever imagined. In late December 1938, in the German capital of Berlin, a chemist named Otto Hahn set up a new experiment in his lab. By the late 1930s, scientists like Hahn understood that everything in the universe is made up of incredibly tiny particles called atoms. They knew that atoms themselves are composed of even smaller particles. Atoms have a central core, or nucleus, made up of protons and neutrons packed tightly together. Surrounding the nucleus are electrons. Scientists also knew that some atoms are radioactive. That is, their nucleus is naturally unstable. Particles break away from the nucleus and shoot out at high speeds. This was useful to experimenters like Hahn because they could use radioactive elements as tiny cannons. Hahn began his experiment with a piece of silver-colored metal called uranium. He placed the uranium beside a radioactive element. He knew that neutrons would speed out of the radioactive material. He knew that some of these tiny particles would hit uranium atoms. The big question was, what happens when a speeding neutron crashes into a uranium atom? The answer was shocking. Han was sure he'd made a mistake. As expected, some of the speeding neutrons hit uranium atoms. As expected, some of the speeding neutrons hit uranium atoms. What staggered Han was that the force of the collision seemed to be causing the uranium atoms to split in two. According to everything scientists knew in 1938, this was impossible. At once excited and disturbed, Han needed help. He turned to his former partner, Lise Meitner, a Jewish physicist who'd been forced out of Germany by Hitler. Han wrote to Meitner at her new office in Sweden, describing the strange results of his experiment. Perhaps you can suggest some fantastic explanation, Han said, of the splitting uranium. We understand that it really can't break up. Meitner responded immediately, agreeing that the news was amazing, but adding, We have experienced so many surprises in nuclear physics that one cannot say without hesitation about anything. It's impossible. A few days later, Meitner's nephew, Otto Frisch, also a physicist, came to Sweden for a visit. Over breakfast, she showed him Hans' letter. I don't believe it, he said. There's some mistake. The two went outside to discuss the mystery. We walked up and down in the snow, I on skis and she on foot, Frisch recalled. They talked over an idea proposed by the great Danish physicist Niels Bohr. Bohr had recently suggested that the nucleus of an atom might act like a wobbly droplet of liquid. If that were true, they asked each other, what would happen if a speeding neutron hit the nucleus of a uranium atom? Could the force of the collision cause the uranium nucleus to stretch and stretch, just like a liquid drop, until it split? They brushed the snow off a fallen log and sat. Meitner pulled out a scrap of paper and pencil, and Frisch sketched a diagram of a circle stretching into a long oval shape and finally breaking in two. Yes, said Meitner, that is what I mean. They agreed, this must be what happened to the uranium atoms in Hans' lab. Meitner took the pencil and paper and began working out the math. If you really do form two such fragments, she said, they would be pushed apart with great energy. An atom splitting was incredible enough. But what made this a world-changing discovery was that if atoms really could be split, they would release energy as they broke in two. How much energy? Just enough, Meitner and Frisch calculated, to make a grain of sand jump. That doesn't sound like much, but keep in mind how tiny atoms are. With 238 protons and neutrons, uranium is the largest atom in nature. Still, each atom is incredibly small. A single ounce of uranium has about 100 quadrillion atoms. What if you had a 20-pound lump of uranium? A 50-pound lump? What if you were able to get all those atoms to split and release energy at the same moment? You'd have by far the most powerful bomb ever built. I feel as if I had caught an elephant by its tail without meaning to, Frisch wrote to his mother. And now I don't know what to do with it. News of the discovery spread quickly within the small world of theoretical physicists. 
Otto Frisch rushed to Copenhagen, Denmark, catching up with Niels Bohr just as Bohr was boarding a ship for America. Frisch began telling Bohr that uranium atoms could split in two and was halfway through his explanation when Bohr slapped himself on the forehead. Oh, what idiots we have all been, shouted Bohr. Oh, but it is wonderful. This is just as it must be. Bohr was so excited he ran home to get a blackboard. He set it up in his cabin on the ship and spent most of the two-week Atlantic crossing exploring this new discovery. By the time he reached New York City in January 1939, he was convinced uranium atoms really could split in two. He took the news to a physics conference in Washington, D.C., where it leaped from one physicist to another. Bohr has just come in, one scientist announced. He's gone crazy. He says a neutron can split uranium. A newspaper reporter attending the conference described the news in a short article, which was picked up by papers across the country. The next morning, a young physicist named Luis Alvarez was sitting in a barber shop in Berkeley, California. While the barber snipped his hair, Alvarez grabbed the San Francisco Chronicle from a pile of papers beside the chair. In the second section, he remembered, buried away someplace, was an announcement that some German chemists had found that the uranium atoms split into two pieces. Alvarez put down the paper. I got right out of that barber chair and ran as fast as I could. He sprinted to the campus of the University of California, where he taught, and ran from lab to lab with the news, soon bumping into one of his fellow professors, Robert Oppenheimer. Alvarez told Oppenheimer that uranium atoms split in two. Scientists were calling it fission. That's impossible, Oppenheimer said. Alvarez explained what little he'd read about fission. Oppenheimer quickly agreed it must be true. It was amazing to see how rapidly his mind worked, said Alvarez. The U business is unbelievable, Oppenheimer told a friend a few days later. U is the chemical symbol for uranium. Like all the scientists involved in the discovery, Oppenheimer was fired up by new ideas in physics, deeper glimpses into the weird inner world of atoms. The thought of making weapons of mass destruction had never occurred to him. But now, suddenly, he couldn't shake it from his mind. Vision might make possible to build a whole new type of explosive. Within perhaps a week, recalled a student, there was on the blackboard in Robin Oppenheimer's office a drawing, a very bad and execrable drawing, of a bomb. Robert Oppenheimer realized something else right away. If it was obvious to him that an atomic bomb might be possible, it was also obvious to everyone else in the global community of top physicists. This would not usually be a problem. In normal times, scientists from around the world freely shared new ideas and theories, but in 1939, normal times were rapidly coming to an end. Adolf Hitler was demanding a big piece of Poland, claiming it rightfully belonging to Germans. Britain and France finally faced the fact that Germany would continue gobbling up territory until stopped by force. At Poland, they drew the line. A German attack on Poland, they warned, would mean war with Britain and France. Hitler waved his fists and raged, I'll cook them in a stew they'll choke on. Calling his military chiefs to Berlin, Hitler announced, Further successes can no longer be obtained without the shedding of blood. He ordered the German military to prepare an all-out invasion of Poland. Hitler knew this might ignite a much wider war, but he was not worried about taking the blame. In starting and waging a war, he told his generals, it is not right that matters, but victory. Close your hearts to pity. Act brutally. The stronger man is right.